Welcome to another edition of the Bird Calls. I'm your host, David Grubb, and joining me is NBA draft analyst Ben Pfeiffer. Um, we talked with Ben before. He's one of my favorite followers on Twitter and just a treasure trove of information when it comes to NBA prospects. Ben, uh, thank you for joining me today. Of course, man. Good, good to good to be back. I always love talking talking Pelicans, um, so I'm always excited to to do this talking draft for sure. It is an interesting year for the Pelicans. They only have one pick, no second round picks this year, unless they try to get back into the draft by doing something else. Um, their first round pick, they they lost in the in the hopes that they would get to sweep uh, swap picks with the Lakers and get a better pick. So they ended up where they're supposed to be, 14th overall. This has not been the best spot to be in the NBA over the last couple of years. The, the previous four picks at that spot, two of them are already gone and on different teams. Um, and then you look at the guys who are in the same place. Well, three of them, excuse me, are, I think are in different teams. And the ones that look like they could be kind of decent, it's taken a while. Aaron Neesmith, it took him a while to grow into a role with the Indiana Pacers. It didn't really have a spot in Boston. Ochai Agbaji gets traded to Utah as part of that big deal there. And he, he started to come on at the end of the season. And, and those two have really been the only ones out of the last few uh, number 14 picks who've made any contributions. Yeah, I think Moses Moody's had some moments too. And I still believe in him um, as a long-term guy. He's just, you know, obviously got picked by a team that is contending and isn't going to be playing their rookies as much. Um but yeah, I think the Pelicans are in an interesting spot. I think there's probably going to be some good options on the board for them. Uh, probably going to be some guys who can contribute. Um, I've seen a lot of different, like, like I've seen, like, I, I feel like every mock I see of them has has them going a different direction. Like, I, I certainly have no idea, like, where they'd be looking or, like, what they're thinking or, like, what would end up happening there. The most practical needs, it seems to me, that everyone would agree with the Pelicans is, number one, they need rim protection. That's Mm -hmm. probably not going to be there at at pick 14 unless you're trying to take a big swing on a prospect on a, you know, on a project um, who may be long and athletic, but does not belong that high in the draft. The other parts would be shot creation and shot making. Uh, The, the, the one thing for me is there are a lot of, as there are every year, there are a lot of six, four guys who can shoot, but the Pelicans also have a lot of six, four guys in their backcourt already who need minutes and, and guys a little, you know, it's a pretty heavily clogged backcourt. Do you think that amongst those prospects, is it more likely that the Pels go for a combo type or are they looking for maybe a taller wing type who can be, come off the bench and just be a, a knockdown shooter? It seems to me like there's going to be a good amount of like wing types available for them, which I agree is like, you know, you got Trey, who I think who's going to be a star. He's the best, but like, you know, they, they need more offense, like shooting out of those wings. I think there's going to be good options. Like seems like Jet Howard is going to be available. Um, you know, tall shooter. Seems like Dariq Whitehead is going to be available, you know, injury concerns, but tall, really, really great shooter as well. Um, I definitely agree with you that rim protection is, is the biggest need. And it's a shame that like, there's not really anybody super great in that range. Um, as like a rim protection prospect, like all the guys you're looking at for rim protectors are either like going to go way higher or like probably, you know, lower level first round picks. Let's talk about some of these guys. Um, Kobe Bufkin is one that, that is mentioned a lot. He tends to be the consensus amongst most. Um, I've seen him in the most boards. Another one of those six, four guys played two seasons at Michigan. First year was okay. Last year made a real big jump as a scorer. Uh, his overall three-point percentage is, has been solid, not fantastic, but definitely an upside guy. Does he, is he the kind of player who could break into a Pelicans rotation on a team that has to win this season? It cannot be in a position like it was this year where you're you're hoping you get in the play in. I feel like Buffkin is well, well, generally I'm a little lower on Kobe Buffkin just than consensus. Like I think of him as more of like a mid late first kind of like a more late first kind of talent um, for a couple reasons. I feel like he could like, if you're looking for a guy to contribute right away, I think he could be a potential option offensively. At least I think defense is probably going to take some time as it does with most rookies. Like that's not really a, like a super rare thing, especially for like a six, four guard 
but you know as you mentioned it's like it, it, it's always harder for smaller guys in the NBA to to really like survive on defense especially earlier in their careers I think the best thing about Buffkin to me is his like play finishing like he's an excellent finisher he's really good like driving off of motion like when he attacks a closeout or gets a screen and those are those are things that the Pelicans do those things that Michigan did like Michigan has a very pro style offense um, and I think we've, we've seen him have success in, in that role. Um, I definitely worry about like long-term what you're getting from him as just like a six, four, like, you know, two guard kind of, who's, you know, a question like, you know, his, his shooting is all right, but I don't really buy yeah. the, the, the three as like a high level threat. Um, his passing is good to me, but not great. Um, same with his like driving and like self-creation on the ball when he doesn't have like an off ball screen. So I think I think Kobe is pretty interesting. I probably would go other directions just because I think knee wise and talent wise, there, in my opinion, would be better options on the board. Um, I would get it as like if they're looking for someone who's going to be like a play finisher type, someone who is going to you know catch the ball in transition off of you know Zion or, or Brandon Ingram or CJ drives and you know go to the rim. I think that makes sense, but I feel like you can get guys who can do that, but also have more of an upside as like a defender or like a wing creator or like a, a shooter or something like that. I think one of the things that they're trying to replicate is they have to find somebody who can do what CJ does shooting wise, but is a better handler of the basketball because a big problem Pelicans had was when CJ had to be in high usage situations. He's not a great creator um, in those positions. He turns yeah. it over a lot. Is a guy like Keontae George, uh, again, another guy that's six, four frame, again a streaky shooter more of a scorer than a shooter how does he kind of fit in that and then that projection I, th- I think Keontae is really interesting in that way um I think he has similar issues to like CJ idea and like being like a six three six four guard who isn't the best creating separation on the ball um I think that's probably Keontae's biggest like overall you know reason that I don't think he's like a top 10 top seven type prospect more like late lottery I really like his shot just the fact that like he takes so many difficult kinds of threes and like Baylor asked him to do so much as a shooter like they asked him to take so many kinds of different threes so I I think from that perspective Keontae can be someone who like is a really effective shooter like off off the ball and off movement and like secondary pick and rolls um almost like similar to, to, to Buffkin like I would probably say he's probably not someone you want like asking them to do a lot of self-creation um, just because like he's not the the quickest in terms of first step his stride length kind of limits him in terms of getting separation and while he's like I think he's going to be a great like si- like similarly like you know great shot maker a great play finisher um, where he's going to be able to hit really tough shots and is a great contested shot maker and always has been and is really strong and can get you know when he's at the rim um, has great finishing tools and touch to hit those tough shots but if they're looking for a guy who wants to like create his own offense on the ball, it's I probably would go would you know not go for Keontae. That's why it's always hard at like especially this 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 range of the draft is like yeah. most yeah. of the guys who are going to be like really creators are going to be gone at this point. Or at least we can really do that. And the other two people that that a lot of folks like Jordan Hawkins, a very good shooter out of UConn, um, and also Nick Smith out of Arkansas, who is again more of the the lean scorer type. Um, if you're going to, you know, Willie Green wants ball movement. He wants people who can make quick reads. Which of those two and where would you rank them amongst those kinds of uh, guards as, as decision makers, as well as uh, the ability to sh- shoot the basketball? Yeah, I think Nick would definitely be my, my favorite option for them at this point. I mean, I think he's probably like, you know, maybe with Keontae, I, I think he's just the best overall prospect that they're going to probably have a chance to get on the board. But aside from that, I think if you're looking for someone in that like shot creation kind of on ball role, I think Nick is the best option there also because he can slide into an off ball role. So, well, he's such a good off ball shooter, you know, as a pure shooter, he's probably not as good as someone like Jordan Hawkins, like as a pure three point shooter. But I think he gives you so much more in terms of, you know, running those secondary pick and rolls or being able to create some offense at the end of the shot clock or having the upside to create offense. Because like, you know, Nick has been like a primary offensive creator since like high school and EYBL. And he's obviously played through so many injuries um, and has had, you know, 
I don't have like, you know, I don't have like in, intel on, on medicals or anything, mm -hmm. but like he dominated EYBL as a 16 year old with a broken hands. He, you know, had success this year, you know, as a score with, you know, myriad lower body injuries. So I, I think Nick, as someone who is like really shifty and is like amazing in terms of touch and that like mid range shot making, who's has a shot that I believe in as well. Um, if I had to go with one of those like off guards, you know, like Keontae, Bufkin, Jordan, you know, Jordan Hawkins, Nick Smith as like, I think he's probably my favorite passer of the bunch. Um, if I had to pick one, I think just his decision making is, is the most consistent, as, as you mentioned. Um, he might not be, have the most like high end reads. Like I think Keontae makes some like really, really amazing passes, especially like in transition or, you know, the, the flashes are great, but the, also like the decision-making is way more inconsistent with Nick. It's probably like the high end isn't really there, but the, the decision-making is really consistent. I think just in terms of like shot creation, shot making, Nick is the best option. And I also think his defense is, I'm a fan of his defense as well. Like he's obviously, you know, on the slender side, which is always a problem, but he's really, really quick on the ball, really great motor, really good fighting through screens and making rotations. So I think Nick Smith would be my my preferred choice for them um, as it, as someone in that, you know, kind of combo role who can do a little of everything on the ball, on, off the ball in a bunch of different like lineups and roles and stuff. Because you look at, at Herb Jones defensively, what he brings to the table, and he's going to play a lot of shooting guard minutes. And then, um, of course, you talk about um, Kyra Lewis Jr., who at 6'4", plays longer than he does because of his reach and his physicality, his speed. Um, Jose Alvarado, at his size, his, still his goal is to be a gnat and to be that aggressive on-ball defender. Dyson Daniels, too, showed elite on-ball defensive skills at, um, as a rookie, which is, again, something you don't always see. So uh, if, you, if Willie Green is going to play you, you better be able to defend the ball as well. So if that's what Nick Smith can bring, that flexibility at least to defend the one, the two spot, I don't think he's physically going to be ready to defend threes in the NBA. Right, yeah. But if he can provide on-ball pressure to the ones and the twos, if he's the best of that group, I think that could move him if the Pelicans do decide to keep that pick or whatever. If it, I think it moves him higher in the in the food chain. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, like the two best defenders, definitely him and, and Bufkin are probably the best of like current defenders. I think Bufkin um, might be the best defender out of that group, but I just generally think Nick's offensive tools are a lot more enticing like Keontae has, you know, really interesting flashes, you know, with how strong he is um, and, you know, the, the, the ability to like make backside rotations and to be like a, you know, a disruptive off ball defender at times and how strong he is on the ball, but he's just like very inconsistent um, at the moment, like with awareness and just general feel, which is, you know, common for high usage freshmen. Like this isn't a thing that's like super damning. Like this is common and same with Hawkins, I think, but, you know, being a little more problematic because he is older, um, he's more experienced, and I, I think he still has those kind of defensive issues, both in terms of like awareness and and you know your team defense, but also he's like you know just like Nick Smith, he's a more slender and a skinnier guy who's going to struggle when it comes to guarding you know those bigger threes and you know bigger combo guards who can really muscle through them. So. The other question would be of the finishers. How would you rank these guys as finishers? Because by the end of the season, Dyson Daniels was afraid to, to attack the basket offensively. Jose Alvarado, again, at 5'10", there's only so much he can do around the bucket. The Pelicans need to be able to get some finishing from their backcourt scorers. Who in this group sets themselves apart as either being able to initiate contact and maybe get to the line or just be able to finish with either hand around the basket? Yeah, I think this is where you're really, you know, pulling for Keontae. Um, Keontae and Kobe Bufkin are the two here. Um, I think that's like one of the big things with Nick Smith is like his touch around the rim is incredible, but he's also like pretty timid in terms of drawing contact. So I think there's, you know, a world where he could develop into a really great finisher if, you know, uh, the coaches are willing to work with him and you know, being physical and getting all the way. But I think there's also a world where he can, you know, struggle because of his size and his lack of willingness to get in there. Where I think Keontae, who isn't like the most explosive vertical leaper, is his main hang up. But he's so strong. His touch is amazing. His like ability to control his body in the air and like hang in the air and take contact and finish. I think, I don't think he had the most amazing free throw rate this year, but I could imagine it going up as he you know learns to be more aggressive and use his body and uses great strength. Um, I think in terms of getting a guy who's like 
has the best finishing tools and is most likely to be able to like get himself those shots, I think it's probably Keontae. Kobe, Kobe Bufkin's also like, I think the play finishing is his, is like his best trait as well, where he's really good at using his like more vertical explosion to, to get up and to get like, you know, above the rim and, and to make those, you know, tough finishes. Um, I think Keontae overall, just like with the touch and the body control and the strength has a bit more upside as a finisher. And I think, you know, his, his added shooting where like he can be a guy who defenses, like I think immediately are going to have to close out really hard to um, who like are going to respect his shot where with, with Buffkin, at least, you know, especially right away, I think there, there could be a world where defenses aren't as willing to, you know, maybe we'll play off him. They'll know he's a good finisher. So they'll, you know, let him take those mid range pull-ups or stuff. Whereas Keonce, I think can get to the rim and finish. So from that perspective, I think as like a finisher, as someone who's finishing plays, as someone who can really work like off the ball and get, you know, once they're at the rim, be effective. I think Keonce is the way I would go. Okay. Let's, let's talk about the bigger wings and they all seem to be big 10 guys. Um, whether you're talking about Bryce Sensabaugh, um, Jalen Uscafino, um, Jed Howard, and Chris Murray. Um, I I tend to gravitate towards Jed Howard uh, at 6'8", um, you know, almost 40% from three. No, he's not a great defender. But again, this is not what you're asking for on this team. He's not going to get heavy minutes. His one job, I think, if comes in is make shots, particularly from the corner. The Pelicans need to generate more corner threes. If you can have him and Trey Murphy on the floor at similar stretches, I think he gives you something that for, for a team like the Pelicans that does not have a lot of players for additional wing minutes to go around, especially if, when Zion and B.I. are both playing. I think you need a guy who can hit shots, and I think he can catch, catch and shoot. I think he can move, and I think he, can, he has overall yeah. solid offensive instincts. I'm fully with you. I love Jet Howard. I think he's been like kind of getting underrated, at least to me. Like it seems like he's falling into like the late teens. And I think like I think he's better than Kobe Bufkin, for example. I think he is like a guy who is like a top 12, top 11 level, you know, top 10 kind of talent, just because he is such an amazing shot maker and shot creator at that size. As you mentioned, like I think he and Trey Murphy would work really well together. Um, as like Trey is like, you know, more of a guy who likes to like, you know, will take like pull-ups or catch and shoot. Whereas Jet Howard is really great at like sprinting around screens and, and coming off of, you know, motion and and hitting those shots while also being someone who can, you know, hit shots on the pull-up or catch and shoot. Yeah. Jet being six, eight, taking like, you know, so many, as many threes as he did, um, as like, you know, almost like 45% of his shots were threes. He's the kind of like big spacer that like NBA teams want for sure. And I think with Jet, there's like some upside there as a creator as well that you might not be getting with some of these other guys. Um, Jet isn't like the quickest guy in the world, but I think he's pretty fast once he gets going. And he has like the handle to, you know, run some pick and rolls and to use his like flexibility. He's he's a very like fluid mover at six foot eight. Mm -hmm. So he can use his like length and his strides to, to get around defenders. And I think as he like develops his strength, this is, you know, the, the, the build is, is currently, you know, lacking, but that's pretty common for 19 year olds. Um, most of them are really lacking in strength at this stage in their career. And the ones who aren't are often like the exceptional ones. So I think Jet as someone who can, you know, be that knockdown shooter, but also has the upside to potentially be more than that one day to be someone who can run, who can, you know, work a little bit with the ball and I think just having, well, yes, he's definitely like a, you know, the defense is, is, you know, a work in progress at the moment. I think the fact that the Pelicans have so many capable wing defenders who are limited offensively, as you said, makes it a great environment for him to you know, do what he does best and not to have to, you know, worry so much about having difficult defensive assignments. But as someone who is really long and and fast and, and has good mo- like movement skills, I think with the, you know, with the right defensive coaching, I don't think he's someone who's like hopeless on defense. I think he's definitely someone who with, you know, a couple of years of maybe G League work or, or just game development, getting stronger, learning defensive, like like NBA defensive technique and learning an NBA defensive scheme could be someone who's like a pretty solid defender just because he is so big and can move really well. So if you can, you know, teach him to be more aware and to improve. And I think he made improvements as the season went on at, at Michigan as well. Um, as a defender. It was just so a very odd season at Michigan this year. Yeah, yes, hot. exactly. Exactly. Very weird season. Like just a weird, 
you know, and like Michigan, as I mentioned, like with Kobe, like they run like an NBA offense, like NBA kind of style stuff on offense and defense. So it's, you know, it is a difficult scheme to execute for sure. Um, so I really like Jet. I think he makes a ton of sense for the Pelicans as well as a shooter shot creator with some passing upside, with some defensive upside maybe. And I, I, I love that fit. He would definitely be my favorite out of these guys for them. Of the other ones, my second would probably be Chris Murray. And I say that because if I can't get the knockdown shooting, and he's not a bad shooter, 35% from three for his career, and, and he got much better over the last two years, he gives you maturity. And the Pelicans have been very successful in bringing in guys who have played consistent basketball in the same system like Herb Jones, like Trey Murphy, like Jose Alvarado. The guys who, who came in, those were the ones who were able to contribute. Even, even a Najee Marshall, who played four years at Xavier, got those years of experience in and was able to understand and accept a role a lot faster than somebody who's been a star. Yeah, I probably would agree. I, I think I would, you know, like I can see a case for Chris or for Bryce. I think they both like, you know, have different strengths and, and bring different things to the table. Um, I definitely do like Chris as like a potential like off ball shot maker. Um, someone who is, you know, also like a little bit of a driver at six, eight um, is probably more comfortable than like his brother was, for example, like putting the ball on the floor, attacking closeouts, running those secondary pick and rolls also is, you know, probably a little bit better on defense as well. Someone who can, you know, definitely has problems with his like mobility and guarding the perimeter at times, but can really defend in the paint as well. Um, yeah. I think Chris Murray would, would make a lot of sense as just kind of like a, like you, like you mentioned, someone who knows how to like play a role and can fit in that scheme, be someone who doesn't need the ball in his hands to, to add value. Um, someone who can make shots off the ball someone who can pass a little bit, someone who's going to be a good cutter, who's going to have that motor on offense. So he probably wouldn't be like, you know, at 14, I, I don't think he'd be my favorite choice just because, no. you know, you know, mainly just because I think there's going to be, you know, better, plentiful, better options. But I do think it would make sense if like, I, I don't think he would be bad for the Pelicans. Like, it, like it would be like a fit. That would be more of a pick where it's like, you know, they're looking for a specific thing and he kind of fits with what they want. Right. I think if, if and it's not, improbable to me that they move back if they're if they're not in love with what, what's available like if one of these yeah. guys if they, if they do really like a jet howard and he does jump up and they say well let's move back and you bring in a chris murray again if he could be your replacement a for Najee marshall if you move off of him um and then you think about it if you can bulk him up a bit you've played a lot of larry nance at the four and five there's a similar larry nance is six seven and was a decent corner shooter when he's when he's healthy I think you could do some of those similar type things with a Chris Murray in short bursts. Yeah, I definitely think that there is a world where, where he could be useful as a cutter, as a shooter, as someone who's like a, like, you know, an off ball driver. Like I, you know, if there's a trade down, which I think like, I honestly like don't hate the idea of trading down for them at all, especially if you trade down like into the range where taking a rim protector, like, you know, like Derek Lively or like Noah Clowney or someone makes more sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think that could be a decent option to target for sure. Uh, let's just hit on the last two. Um, Jalen hoods Scafino um, out of Indiana, uh, more athletic, a very athletic guy. Um, uh, I, I like his open court abilities. And then of course, Bryce sends ball a little more physical at six, six, kind of more of a, 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 a sturdy six, six swing man. Yeah, I think Bryce is definitely the one I would prefer. I just think Bryce is a lot better as a prospect overall. Um, but he, he's he's interesting um, because Bryce is such like a dominant on-ball shot maker with so many other weaknesses. Um, I think like if, if a team like the Pelicans is to take him that, like, okay, we're going to bet on his shot creation being really strong, bet on him being a guy who's able to create shots um, on the ball, who's able to get generate his own offense, uh, maybe when like the, the stars are on the bench or injured or whatever, he can be someone who comes off the bench or whatever is able to get his buckets um, from all over the floor while also being a really great, like spot up shooter, catch and shoot guy. Um, but you know, the weaknesses, of course, like the passing is very weak in terms of like willingness mm -hmm. and just like general ability. The defense is, is very weak in terms of like awareness and some kind of movement skills, you know, potentially some upside again, because he is so sturdy, as you mentioned, like there's a lot of strength there, but currently just very far away 
Um, but like same we talked about with Jet, though I think Bryce is probably a worse defensive bet than Jet. Like it is still a good the Pelicans are a good place for these like defense challenged wings to go because of all the great defensive wings they have. Um so I think Bryce would make the most sense if they want like someone like as we kind of talk like I feel like he kind of fits more with these like combo shot making guards almost just because that's his skill set more than being like a wing type despite his size, which is an enticing thing for sure. Um and something they could definitely value. And like I think, you know, I think that would be a reasonable choice at 14 again it would be like probably better options but i would t- definitely understand making that making that pick um jhs switch you know, um i definitely think a little lower of just in general as a prospect and i feel like most of the reason that i would be like kind of out on the pelicans going for him is because he's someone who like really needs the ball in his hands yes to like yes. get the most value like he's at his best when he's like creating shots in the mid-range and like you know, making like pick and roll reads and where he struggles is like as a catch and shoot guy, um, necessarily like creating his own space on drives with without a screen. So while I think there is upside for him as like a guard who, you know, has that size is an OK defender, you know, pretty solid athlete with with that kind of like with that kind of, you know, shot making and pick and roll creation, which is, of course, so valuable in the league. Like. I think especially for a team like the Pelicans um, who like have so many players already who you want the who like need the ball in their hands like and so many great like players like so many dominant players with the ball and Ingram and CJ and Zion and all those guys I feel like it would make more sense to go another direction at that point yeah I think any ball dominant player unless you're willing to give the second unit scoring responsibilities to them doesn't right and I think JHS isn't like that great of a score to where the point like if you're looking for a second unit score you like you should draft Bryce like that's like that should be your guy if you're looking for someone who can get buckets you know against bench defense that's the guy you're going for um I just want to quickly shout out Dariq Whitehead as a potential option I was um, going to ask you who, for some sleepers on it. yeah okay yeah I was gonna say, like like in this kind of wing bunch where I mean I guess like the main thing with him is the medicals as he just like has not been healthy at all and like his his foot has just been really really um like it's really bothered him it's really like zapped a lot of his vertical athleticism as like he was like a super athlete above the rim finisher in high school who really struggled to get off the ground um so that's obviously something that you know the the medical staff and whoever's gonna like know more about than than we would but I think in terms of someone who fits what they need as another amazing shooter Dariq um developed a ton as a shooter over his time in high school and was awesome at Duke like took a ton of threes like 50 percent of his shots were threes he shot like 43% or something obviously the volume is you know low but he's shown to be a great shooter at every stop someone who can create his own shots like off a step back or off of a cross like so he has that maybe upside you know one day to be an on-ball player also someone who's a really good passer as well um someone who is able to attack these closeouts get downhill and we've seen him going back to high school as he was like a top five level recruit like be like a pick and roll ball handler and be a tough shot maker and the fact that you know, this Duke season wasn't ideal for him, but he was able to excel in it in like an off ball complimentary role. I think it's nice to see because that's the role he'd be playing in the NBA right away, at least. Like, I think like why I like Dariq so much is like there's upside for him to be that on ball guy, to be Mm. that star level player. But we've seen him like in this last year at Duke, especially late in the season, he was really great playing that team complimentary role, hitting shots off the ball, making smart decisions, you know, playing great defense. I think his movement is really, his movement like laterally um, in terms of staying in front of guys is really, is really good. He's always been a great defender, like getting blocks with his size and his length. So I, I really like to I think he would be another, like up there with jet um, or like Keontae is my favorite one, what as one of my favorite potential options at 14 or maybe even for a trade down. Cause it seems like he's going in like the mocks that I've seen, like around 20 ish. So he mm-hmm. would be a potential other guy to get in a trade down if they're you know willing to take that risk or they feel good about the medicals um they you know they have they'll do their own research or information and they you know want that guy who can slot in as like a role player who can play defense who can really shoot make decisions but i think also has the ceiling to you know i think one day can be a lot more than that also is one of the youngest players in the draft too like there's just so much to like about Derek um that i think it would be worth any potential injury risk at that point lastly um let's Say the Pelicans don't get back into the draft. 
um, in the second round or anything. So if they were trying to snag a big, you know, and, and hope that that person falls out, who would be those late second round undrafted free agent type bigs who could potentially help them? Because I don't see, I, I think they're very willing to move Jonas Valanciunas and I don't see any way that they bring back Jackson Hayes unless he's willing to take very little money. And I think Willie, uh, Billy Hernan Gomez wants to leave because he doesn't like his role. So there's your entire front court. You can't count on Larry Nance to play 80, 82 games in a season anymore. They still need to add somebody. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this, this, this is the tough thing for them. Um, there's just like, not a ton of options in like the range that they're picking like if they were picking 10 spots later like it would be like perfect for them to get like someone like Derek Lively or like Noah Clowney so in terms of the guys who seem like they're going to be like available like I think the number one like pipe dream would be Adem Bona um Adem Bona uh, out of UCLA who mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm pretty sure he's still like might go back to UCLA. I don't know. I don't think he's like officially. Yeah, I think his entered. toe is in, but he hasn't signed anything. Right. But it seems like you know, like he was really good at the combine. You know, his his stock seems to be going up. And I think as someone who you know is projected in like the mid, you know, like mid 40s, 50s, could maybe fall out. Maybe the Pelicans like buy a second or something to to go get a guy like that, who I think is a really really amazing defensive prospect. Um, someone who's like, you know, not going to give you anything on offense outside of, you know, screening and finishing and not someone who's going to do a ton of different stuff. Um, but what he does do would do well, which is versatile pick and roll coverage and rim protection are so valuable in the NBA. Like it's so valuable to have a guy who can have these great like mobility. He's really strong. He can jump really high. He understands like multiple pick and roll coverages like at UCLA we see him being really effective on like hedge hedges and ices where he blitzes a, a ball handler and is able to recover using his length and his motor and his speed to get back in plays he can protect the rim as well as a post defender with his great strength and you know with his vertical leaping and his instincts so like Bona is a, like he's you know becoming one of my favorite guys in this draft as someone who you know like isn't like a star upside guy for sure but plays such an important role um, and is such like a need in the modern NBA, like teams need guys who can be like these like versatile rim protector, pick and roll defenders. So he would for sure be my favorite guy um, from, for that other, other, other ones. I think Colin Castleton from Florida is another interesting guy who's almost, who I would bet is probably going to go undrafted. Mm -hmm. um, he was really good at the G League elite camp. Um, I kind of, I'm surprised he didn't get a combine invite because I thought he was like the best player at that camp, but it seems like other people were surprised too. But just another like 6'11", really great rim protector um, who developed his ball skills a lot this year, like has really nice touch around the rim as a post scorer, can attack closeouts and like, you know, run dribble handoffs and does some simple stuff despite not being like an amazing shooter or anything. Is someone who can, you know, get to the rim like off the dribble a little bit, which is really cool for, you know, a 6'11 center who has that mobility, um, even if he's not a shooter, you know, I think he, he had like a 10 block rate this year for Florida, really, really impressive rim protector as like coming over from the help side, as well as, you know, from like the post, even though he's a bit skinnier, he's very long and, and you know, pretty explosive. So I think he would be a good option as well for them. Um, there's also Naquan Tomlin, out of um who was really impressive for Kansas State you know in their in their deep tournament run mm -hmm. just another like upsidey rim protector type with who's shown the ability to spot up a little bit and attack off the dribble a little bit definitely more raw in terms of like feel and defensive like positioning and awareness than someone like Castleton or like Bona or like Bona but another option and then um the other guy I I would imagine as an option is uh Ryan Kalkbrenner out of Creighton um just like an enormous enormous person um like seven one like and i like legit seven one probably um really great touch on the interior as like a post score has shown the ability to pass a little bit um to you know a little fairly comfortable like taking open spot up threes and you know with him the the kind of concerns are like his movement skills are pretty weak you know you, he's not someone you really want to ask like to run like complex pick and roll coverages or to make like to cover a lot of ground but if you need someone to just park in front of the rim be a deterrent with his length and his size and his you know instincts at the rim I think Kalkbrenner could be a potentially good option and again as someone who is you know I think there's a good chance he goes 
undrafted as well. There's a good chance that he, you know, isn't someone who gets picked, someone who could be like a two-way or an E10 kind of guy mm-hmm. um, for the Pelicans. And then like, just quickly, not exactly this role, but I want to shout out um, Tosan a woman out of uh, Princeton who like, you know, people caught on him in the tournament and then he was really, really awesome you know, all, at all of the combines and stuff as like, he, he's not like a center is the only like six, nine, but I think he has like a seven, one, seven, two wingspan um, and is explosive and someone who is a really great mover and someone who can, you know, kind of protect the rim as a secondary guy, as well as being someone who would provide, you know, way more offensive utility than any of these guys we've been talking about. So those are some of the ones off the top of my head, at least could be someone I'm forgetting, but I think those are going to be the best options as okay. it seems like players like, Trace Jackson Davis, like Deron Holmes, other big men like that are probably going to be off the board at that point. So, Ben, thank you so much, man. Um, I think the fans are going to get a lot from this one, from this conversation. And uh, I hope we get to talk again as we get closer to the draft. Of course. I, I'd love to. Always good to talk draft, you know, talk a bunch of cool prospects. I appreciate the time. Yeah. Tell the folks again how they can uh, keep up with you, man. And look, this man is open for work. And I'm telling you, he does fantastic <laughs> stuff. I'm telling you, so if you are yeah, looking I, for I appreciate a that great draft analyst, this is somebody to contact. Appreciate that as a recent co- post-college grad who's trying to figure out his life. But, That's right. Um, yeah, you can find me, like, you know, anything I ever do on t- will be on Twitter at BJPF underscore, um, which is my Twitter handle. I'm probably going to start, you know, re-up my own YouTube channel. Um, I did a video on Grady Dick the other day. Um, which is like my first post in forever because I'm out of school and you'll have some time now finally. So hopefully I'll be able to get some more of those out and I'll you know have clips and stuff on my on my Twitter. So yeah, just just give me a follow there and that's about it. All right, man. Let let me know as you put more videos. I will make sure I have them up too. For sure. Thanks so much. Appreciate you having me on. All right. Until the next time. This has been. Bird Talks. Be good.